if you think about what behavioral science is, it is thousands upon thousands of uh, researchers running studies looking into what actually changes behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, I would struggle to think of a more relevant topic if you work in a retailer. Good morning and welcome to the Innovate podcast. We're delighted to have Richard Shotton, uh, behavioural scientist extraordinaire, uh, as our guest uh, this morning. Uh, Richard is the author of The Choice Factory, which is a book that has influenced um, me personally and a number of things here at, uh, at Viper in terms of how we uh, consider behavioural science, how we apply it to the field of uh, product uh, innovation. And uh, yeah, delighted to be talking to Richard today. So Richard, uh, Richard, welcome. Oh, very nice to see you again. Um, Richard, uh, just to start with, tell, tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself in terms of your background and how you got into behavioural science, first of all. Ooh, okay, so background's been working in marketing um, and in terms of how I got into behavioural science, back in 2004, I think it was, uh, I was working on a pitch for, or not a pitch, a project for the NHS um, and I happened to be reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, at the same time. Right. Yep. At the back of that book, there's just a, a page or two on a 1960s psychology experiment by two American psychologists called Latin and Dali. And in it, they come up with an idea called the bystander effect. So essentially, their experiments show that if you ask loads of people for help, there is a diffusion of responsibility. If you want to get right. someone to help you, better to ask an individual. So read that experiment and I thought, well, wait a minute, this is really applicable to the challenge we have at hand. At the time, we were trying to encourage people to donate blood and the standard tactics go out and say, blood stocks in England and Wales are low, please donate. But according to Latin and Dali, we'd be victims of the bystander effect. We're asking everyone to help. So the chances are most people think, well, I'm going to leave it up to my neighbour. Why should I go through the pain and hassle of donating? Right. So I spoke to the creative agency told them about this experiment and made a very simple suggestion said look why don't we stop saying blood stocks are low in england please donate why don't we tailor that message to wherever the audience lives so if you're in basildon you might see blood stocks low in basildon please donate now it's a very crude application very simple application nothing clever or creative about it but what was interesting for me was the the performance of those ads went up by about 10 percent. so cost per donation dropped by about right. 10 percent and when that happened, I kind of thought, well, OK, this one experiment was super useful, but what about all the others out there? And what I've been doing ever since, really, is trying to take findings from academia, well-known ones or lesser known ones, and think, well, how could you apply this experiment that's been run in robust conditions? How can you apply it to a sales and marketing challenge? And yeah, that was 2004, and you know, essentially I haven't, I haven't looked back since. Uh, I've been hooked on the topic ever since. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I find the topic fascinating myself, and I guess you know, in, our, in our world, we're trying to uh, figure out how we apply those that, that, that research to the world of product innovation, which is yeah, what we're going yeah, to be discussing uh, today. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, my background is marketing, but the, the experiments aren't initially run for marketers. They are run to understand what genuinely motivates people, how you can effectively yep. change behaviour. So in the same way a marketer wants to change behaviour, I think it's exactly the same set of principles. They just you can just apply them in a very different way if you're interested in product innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so um, in every episode of the uh, Innovate podcast, we like yeah. to start fairly gently and just dig into um, a little bit about you before we kind of get into the uh, the main topic. So four or five rapid fire questions, um, just so the listeners kind of understand a little bit more about uh, Richard. Um, so, first of all, what's your favourite town or city in the UK for food? Uh, I'd have to say London. So I live in South London and okay. I think the sheer scale of the place means that you know, whatever cuisine you're interested in, there's always something out there. So, yeah, I think London for its sheer variety. Yes. I, yeah, I, I, I live there. Just... say where are my least favourite places currently. <laughs> uh, I went on holiday to Oban this year. Uh, absolutely beautiful part of the world, but I right. had the worst uh, 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 sickness after 
eating, oh, no. uh, eating some shellfish. So I think oh, currently no. London's top, <laughs> Oban, Oban is my least favorite. Yeah. Um, so what, what would your death row meal be? And I'm guessing it wouldn't be shellfish from... <laughs> well, from that case. Yeah, it might be a way of getting out of it. Uh, something very, 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 very slow cooked. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd try and think yeah. of some kind of weasel way out of, uh, uh, out of it. How can I <laughs> delay this as much as possible? Yeah. <laughs> um, and what, what would you say to a, a young, uh, I don't know, academic researcher, executive looking to get into behavioural science as a discipline or, or academic subject? How would you kind of sell it to people uh, looking to uh, build his career there? Well, okay, so I would argue that, especially if you're going to apply this practically, which is where my uh, experience is, I would argue, firstly, this is a topic worth getting into because it's phenomenally relevant. Yeah. Mm -hmm marketers product innovators businesses are trying to change people's behavior so everyone is in the business of behavior change if you learn this skill you will have a very valuable uh, set of knowledge that you can then apply in business yeah for sure and i would argue you know normally if that's the case there is um an oversupply of people who already know about it but because behavioral science has only i think become of mass interest reasonably recently <clears throat> if you're starting out in your career it's actually wonderful now if you get four or five years and your bell you'll know as much as as, as most people now, whereas if you go into a much more established career you know, there are lots and lots and lots of other people who've got 20 30 40 years experience so wonderful combination of both being very practical very relevant and i think you'd have you you have quite a unique skill set if you, you uh, spend your time wisely right is, is there an increasing amount of, of young people studying behavioral science at university at various different yes yeah, so, i mean it's only been a, a topic of that you could study at university reasonably recently there's quite a few masters right. programs now yeah i've got to be a little bit cautious though in that i would always argue behavioral science is essentially a, a continuation of applied psychology so I think if you're a behavioural scientist, okay. you should be drawing on studies that go all the way back to the 1890s. But this attempt to apply it in business, attempt to apply it, especially well, marketing, is much is much more recent. I think. Okay, and and it's probably worth we can't make the assumption that all of the listeners to this podcast know, let's say, anything about behavioural science. Just the the yeah. very kind of basic concepts you. You know, as as I describe them, which is probably quite badly, you've got system one uh, thinking and system two thinking. Just just describe those two uh, yeah, ways so, as a kind of brain. Yeah, I'm going to try and describe behavioural science in a, a sentence. I would essentially say it's the study of how people actually behave rather than how they claim to behave. Mm -hmm. And if there is a broad theme to this topic, it's that people are overwhelmed with decisions during the day. Mm -hmm. so they don't have the time or the energy or the wherewithal to work out those decisions in a fully considered way. And instead, they rely on what psychologists call heuristics, or what we might just call quick rules of thumb, to make decisions yeah. in a fast way. So the argument is that people are cognitive misers, that thinking is effortful, it's energy intensive, and therefore we try and, and ration it. And one of the ways we ration it is using these quick rules of thumb for speedy decision making. Now, those rules of thumb are prone to biases. And if we're aware of those biases, when we're designing our products and we're designing our communications, we can essentially work with human nature rather than against it. So right. Okay. One example, one of these heuristics is an idea called social proof. You know, we tend to copy what others do. So if you tell people or make your product appear like it's popular it will become become more popular still okay. Okay. that's one of the insights it's very robust got lots of evidence behind it certainly practical marketing uh, product innovation implications um, and there are literally thousands of these studies out there so you, know, you can just need to match the right studies the right challenge you have in front of you okay so uh, applying that to the the, the world of, of product innovation and, and I guess getting into the kind of the, the media topics for, for today, um, you know, do, do you see much evidence of, of behavioural science being applied to, to product innovation or do you think those two applications are pretty nascent in, the, in their, their combination? Oh, no, I, I, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, I think it may be the classic example that people might be familiar with. I think it's a really good example of showing a behavioral insight in a piece of product design is Nespresso. So yep. there's a principle known as price relativity, which is essentially the idea that when people weigh up prices, they don't do it in an absolute sense. They do it in a comparative sense. So nothing is good or bad value. It's only good or bad value when it's compared to something else. Mm -hmm. Now, that principle, I think, has been applied amazingly by Nespresso and many, many other brands, but Nespresso is probably the best. You, know, you could argue that if a lesser team than Nestle had designed the product, what they probably would have done was stick those coffee granules into kilo bags and sold them on the shelves at Sainsbury's. Now, if they'd done that, and they let's say they sold it at the same per gram price they do today, a kilo of Nespresso is about £100, give or take a bit. Right. Now, a £100 bag of coffee, if you came across that in Sainsbury's, there's no way you know, you're going to ignore a £15 bag of Dow Egberts and take that home. You would feel morally reprehensible, probably. You'd feel absolute rip off. Yeah. But what they did, of course, was not sell their product in that manner. They sold it in pods. A pod gives you a cup size serving of coffee. Uh, and once you see a cup size serving, your natural comparison set changes. It's no longer Dow Egberts or Cafe Direct. It's no longer other bags of roast and ground coffee. When you think of cups of coffee, the comparison set is Starbucks or Cafe Nero. So suddenly the 60 or 70 pence that Nespresso want for a pot of coffee looks like it's amazing value compared to the three pounds that Starbucks want for a flat white. Yeah, but 70 pence for a pod, 100 pounds for a bag, it's exactly the same per gram price. But one feels like a complete rip off, one feels like uh, an absolute bargain. Yeah, that to me is a brilliant and creative use of a very well known psychological bias. And you could argue Nespresso have made billions of pounds from, from that, uh, um, that tactic. So yeah, I do yeah. think uh, product innovators, product designers will be harnessing these biases. Um, some of it will be actively and purposefully, and they'll go out and look for um, experiments that can that can help them. Other yeah. times, though, I think if someone is a very good creative, very good designer, they're often remarkably well attuned to how people behave. And it might be that they have just noticed these ideas in their dealings with people, you know, and not seen the uh, academic evidence. You know, and often practitioners get to some of these ideas before the academics do. Right. So okay. there's an amazing set of experiments called the Prattfall Effect from, from Elliot Aronson. So it's essentially this idea that we prefer people or products who have a flaw. And he ran his first experiment to this idea 1966. Mm -hmm. Back in 1959, the creative director Bill Birnbach came up with this quote, a small admission gains a large acceptance. And what he okay. meant by that was if you tell people a problem with your product, they'll often believe your other claims much, much more. And he, or at least right. his agency, put that into practice with things like VW, you know, ugly is only skin deep, America's slowest fastback. Uh, right. or Avis 1962, uh, we're number two, so we try harder. And yep. They were applying this idea of the Prattfall effect, admitting a flaw to great, gain greater believability. Six, seven years before the academic had ever published right. his, uh, his data. So yeah, I think there will be designers using these ideas, either absolutely and directly inspired by behavioral science, or the best designers, I think, will know many of these ideas intuitively. Yeah. I find the Nespresso example very powerful. We, we were doing some behavioural science um, research right at the start of the Viper journey, so you know, probably seven or eight years ago now. And, and, and the academic that was advising us at the time, he, he talked constantly about context matters. So, you know, people's behaviour um, in response to, you know, kind of similar products, whatever it might be, can, can be completely different in, in very different contexts. And, and as you say, you, you're very happy to pay three pounds now for a, for a coffee in, in Starbucks. Whereas if that same price ratio was applied in Tesco when you were buying your, your jar of instant coffee, it, it would, it would be ludicrous and no one would be, yeah, no one would absolutely. go anywhere near it. Yeah. Uh, it's, sorry, go on. Go on. It, it's effectively the same thing in a different 
in different packaging. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, although I'm not sure if Starbucks would like to compare to instant coffee, but maybe we no, to compare no. to roasting ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the one the only thing that's probably worth stressing is I think that Nespresso example is quite well known. And I wouldn't want people to think it's just Nespresso that does it. You know, if you go around the supermarket, you start to see this again and again and again. I think the more recent example of someone who's applied this idea is uh, Seedlet. So this is the 25 quid a bottle stuff, uh, non-alcoholic, you mix it with tonic, you've got a non-alcoholic version of uh, a gin and tonic. Yeah. Now, everything they do with that brand is about making the comparison set in people's minds, craft gins. So you look at the bottle and it's got this wonderful kind of Victoriana design. It looks like a craft gin. It's in a gin shaped bottle. In the supermarket, it's sighted very close to the gins, often you know, of a non-alcoholic spirit section. They refer to it as a distilled non-alcoholic spirit. Everything is about trying to make the comparison set craft gins. Mm -hmm. So when they go out and charge 25 pounds, People think, okay, well, I would pay thirty pounds for a craft gin. I'm getting a five pound discount. That's you know fairish. It doesn't have any alcohol after all, and people buy this stuff. But you could easily imagine a hypothetical world in which someone had created this spirit, um, but they had decided, okay, well, or Super or Tesco's had told them, no, we're putting this stuff in the cordial aisle. And maybe it was sold in a plastic bottle, day glow colours, and it's between Robinsons and Ribena. Yeah. Now, even if this stuff tastes like the nectar of the gods, even if it was absolutely amazing in terms of its taste, there is no way in that hypothetical world that anyone would spend more than five or six pounds on it. Because their benchmark comparison price would be you know, a three pound bottle of Ribena. Now, mm -hmm. If it tasted amazing, they might pay double that amount, but they're not going to pay 10 times the amount because it would transgress fairness norms. So absolutely, you've got examples like Nespresso, which made billions, but Seedlip, I would say, is a smaller, you know, but probably they don't actually make millions out of this, but a smaller example of the same principle. You know, shift your comparison set, and you can shift people's willingness to pay by absolute orders of magnitude. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So yeah. for the lesson for retailers there, if they want to add more value into particular categories that might have seen price deflation over sustained period of time is effectively kind of reframe it and recreate it and, and you know, physically yeah. move it in the, in, in, yeah, in the store. Yeah, it could be through design, sighting, just how you introduce the product to people. Um, and I've, so, I've kind of talked about case studies so far, and that's always a little bit dodgy because it's not, they're not running academic experiments. They are um, launching a product and there are often multiple variables that, that change at the same time. But, I did an experiment with um, King Cobra. I don't know if it's still around. This was about seven or eight years ago. This, but if people haven't seen it, it's like Cobra Lager, but in a bigger bottle, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's seven fifty ml bottle. And I think it was about seven or eight percent. And we got people to try this beer alongside other beers, and we tried a little bit of subterfuge. We didn't tell them why we were uh, running the experiment. They thought they were just rating various different beers and comparing the the quality of the, of the taste. And what we found, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say people were prepared to pay three pounds for this beer when we asked them, you know, what the, what they thought it was worth. Yeah. Next group of people, exactly the same setup, range of different drinks, tasting them all, saying how much they're prepared to pay, how much they like the taste. But this time the King Cobra was served alongside bottles of wine. And what we found was when people gave their, this is a different group of people, and that different group responded on how good value they thought, or what they were prepared to pay for King Cobra, the average answer was saying like four pounds. What we think is happening here is by changing the reference set, the benchmark people are prepared to pay changes. So when it's served with wines, people think at the time they thought five was a fair amount to pay for a wine. They recognize King Cobra is not as strong. It's a beer after all, so they reduced down but they don't reduce it that much just goes about four pounds yeah whereas when people had the cobra served with beer you know maybe the price they're prepared to pay bottle is two quid yep. they recognize king cobra is in a bigger bottle it's more alcoholic so they're prepared to pay more they adjust upwards to about three pounds but the key point is people take that benchmark and it affects their later estimations they use it as a anchor they adjust from that anchor 
but they tend to not adjust far enough. So even when you strip back all the other variables, you just focus on this context of consumption, we can see in very controlled circumstances, this idea of price relativity happen. It's very interesting. So you've referenced two or three biases so far, things like anchoring and, uh, and framing and relativity. If, if, um, if you were kind of training or, or mentoring a product developer on, on behavioral science, so someone who's spending their, their days you know, developing product innovation and thinking about products to bring to market, what would the two or three kind of biases that you would really try to ingrain in them be yeah. and, and, and why, I guess, and what was the relevance to innovation? Yeah, of course, of course. So discuss price relativity. Um, I only just touched on social proof and that, that might not at first glance look like it's uh, relevant for a product design, but I think it definitely is. Um, if people aren't familiar with this uh, idea, uh, we mentioned earlier that it's essentially a description of the fact that people are a herd species. You know, we copy what others do. Mm-hmm. Now, there's lots of academic evidence for this. Um, one study, for example, by Keith Kaiser in the University of Groningen, he finds an alleyway where there are lots of bikes parked in Holland. And he puts flyers over the handlebars and he monitors whether people put the rubbish in the bin or they just chuck it on the ground. Now, what's quite interesting is in his experiment, he sets up two different scenarios. First scenario, before he puts the flyers on the bikes, he cleans the alleyway. So he makes it look as if most people are responsibly putting their litter in the bin. Right. And I'm trying to remember back. I think, let's say, it's roughly, it's we're within 5%, 30% of people in that scenario chuck their litter on the floor. Next scenario, a different group of people, different time, he purposely makes the alleyway look messy, sprays some graffiti on the walls, chuck some litter on the floor. Um, in that scenario, he set up a social norm where it looks like most people litter. And about 60% of people litter in this scenario. So depending on what we think most other people are doing, we're seeing this doubling in terms of littering. If it looks right. like it's a normal behavior, lots of people do it. If it looks like few people um, are littering, most people don't. So a subtle cue about the popularity of a uh, behavior can change how likely people are to do it. Okay. Is, is that what some of the, the beauty brands would, would do on their advertising where they say nine out of 10? Oh, yeah. So, so that to me would be a literal application. If you go out and you, you say, we're Britain's most popular lager, uh, nine out of 10 customers recommend it. Um, yeah. We've got 10,000 five-star reviews. That's literal application to social group and marketers right. do that quite a lot maybe not as much as they should do but they do it quite a lot i think you can take that underlying principle though and apply it to product design mm-hmm. and the uh, the application should be how can you make your product look as popular as possible often products when they are used they are invisible no one notices i think the job of a product innovator is to think how can we make our product look much more become much more visible mm-hmm. so recent ex- recent ish example from britain uh, fintech sector uh, someone applying this is monzo yeah you know, think back to the time you've been in a cafe you probably don't notice most people getting out their debit card or credit card mm-hmm. you know, if someone gets out an hsbc card it's completely interchangeable with a lloyd's or a barclays one from a distance you, yep. you wouldn't notice they're all bland uh, pastel colors. So for those brands, lots of people actually use them, but what actually happens doesn't matter. It's, it's the perception of popularity that matters. Mm-hmm. You, you don't notice that that behavior. Compare that with Monzo. Now, they have made their card utterly unmissable. It is this bright, bright pink card. It, uh, they call it hot coral. If right. anyone gets out a Monzo card in the queue, you're going to notice your eyes are attracted to that ridiculously yeah. gay glow color. So they have made a behavior that most competitors allow to be invisible. They've made it visible. Now, they look much more popular than they are, and that will set in train a virtuous circle of social proof. So Monzo have used distinctive colors, but there are lots of other ways to appear more popular than you are. Now, you've got to think for your product, 
do as many people as possible know the product is being used? How can you make usage um, noticeable? Because if you, the default is often that it's, that it's hidden away. So yes, I think social proof is an absolute must for any uh, product innovator. How can you make your product appear more popular than it actually is? Okay. The, the other one, um, you mentioned a couple. Um, one other area might be worth thinking about is not just creating a desire to use the product, but creating a associated moment for the product use. Right. Um, there's an idea that psychologists have called the intention to action gap. If you just motivate people to want to do something, it's not particularly effective. And many of us are motivated to exercise, to stop smoking, to eat healthily. Very few of us actually do it. If you just increase motivation, it doesn't have a huge effect on actual behavior change. So psychologists call this the intention to action gap. Now, there are a few experiments which suggest one way around that is to combine motivation with a trigger moment. So a time, a place, or a mood in which people associate with your product. So there's a lovely study by Sarah Milne at the University of Bath in which she shows if you motivate people to want to exercise, um, about 35% of the people in her experiment did so, maybe 38 actually. Right. If you motivate them and get them to, to say when, where, or with whom they're going to exercise, you know, in her study back in 2002, I think 91% of people uh, exercised at least once. Right. What she argued is motivation is just kind of nebulous and vague what you do is if you attach a behavior like exercise to a particular time say tuesday afternoons when that time comes around that that acts as a trigger and it converts the vague desire into concrete action right so a lot of the academic studies have been done on things like eating healthily or exercising but this principle can be applied commercially so I would argue champagne is, is brilliant at doing this. It's not just a wonderful tasting uh, alcoholic drink. It's one that has a massive cultural association with a particular moment. Celebration equals champagne. Yeah. And I would argue their probably unprecedented success has been driven not just by the you know, amazing quality of the product. It's also the fact that it has such a strong association with a particular moment. So, yes, make your product desirable, but if you just rely on that, I think it's a bit of a gamble. What you really want to do is attach your product to a particular time, place, or, 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 or mood. Right, okay. And, and I guess to the, the, the opposite of that would be brands that try to own too many different occasions and they kind of, they lose the ownership of any, any individual one. Yeah, they're very, yeah, very good point. I think there's probably uh, more humility needed in marketing. The change of behaviour is bloody hard yeah, yeah. Um, better to successfully associate yourself with you know, a particular moment rather than trying to do everything so you know champagne have shown you know you can build a multi-billion pound business by a very strong association with one particular moment yeah. and a moment that doesn't come around that often yeah so when when as, as a behavioral scientist when you when you see consumers in in um in supermarkets in, in convenience stores um, what, what are you witnessing? I mean, one, one of the, the challenges that, that I've always seen is the power of habit. I don't know if that you would kind of classify that as a heuristic as a behavioral scientist, but try, people buy very similar things over and over again because I guess it's the, it's the set of decisions with the least friction. It's the, it's the easiest thing. You buy a particular type of cheddar, a particular flavor of yogurt, and you can, you can go around the supermarket on almost autopilot. So, yeah. you know, how, how, do kind of, how would a brand break that how would a new product get cut through yeah so um you're absolutely right around habits being linked with behavioral science and i think it's if we went back to this original insight from behavioral science which is people don't have the time to work all their decisions yeah. in a fully, fully thought through about yeah if you weighed up every decision you never leave the house in the morning if you thought about how, what what means of transport am i get to work what type of breakfast i have how am i going to clean myself mm -hmm. and you just do the same thing again and again until a disruptive force destabilizes those habits. So yeah, it habits are like an extreme version of these rules of thumb or, or, or heuristics. 
Um, there's an awful lot of research into habits. A um, couple of interesting areas. Firstly, in terms of disrupting existing habits, one of the most interesting findings is that there are predictable moments when habits are weakened. So right. there's an idea, for example, from Catherine Milkman, uh, who's at Wharton. She says, one of the biggest drivers of human behavior is our desire to be consistent with our past selves. Many cultures have this negative terminology, negative language about inconsistent people. So she says there is an opportunity to break from the shackles of consistency at the start of new time periods. When we go into a new time period, our linkage with our past self is weakened slightly and we're more open to change. Right. Now, that's a logical argument. The great thing about behavioral science, though, is nothing is ever argued from logic alone. Everything has to be proved experimentally. So she shows uh, by looking at a series of found data sets that this insight holds. So she looks at Google search terms around things like um, dieting or quitting smoking, yep. volume of these terms. She looks at gym registration data. She looks at a website called Stick, where people make public pledges to change their behavior. And for each of these uh, data sets, she sees a pronounced spike at the start of new time periods. So very simple application of that is if you want to change someone's behavior, focus your efforts beginning of the year, beginning of the month, beginning of the week, after those birthdays, okay. after they've come back from holiday. You know, habits are slightly degraded at those moments. The, they're easier to change. Right. Um, I've done something similar around this, but looked at like bigger disruptions in people's lives. And I've shown that if someone undergoes what I'd call a life event, divorce, marriage, move house, have a baby, they are about two and a half times more likely to try new brands, even in completely unrelated categories. Right. So, okay. yeah, absolutely. There are behavioral science experiments that identify when you can try and disrupt habits. And then there's probably an even body, bigger body of work that talks about um, how you can recreate those habits positively. I think some of those steps to recreate habits can be brought into, into product design. Right, okay. So, for example, the beginning of the week, people would be more, not likely, but more, more open to kind of buying healthier products, for example, or, or exercising. Oh, so, so, uh, so it extends beyond that. So, um, there, uh, so there is yeah, absolutely true, but also trying new lagers, trying new gambling products, trying new sin goods. It's right. not just about healthiness. It's the idea that most of the time we're an autopilot. Yeah. We just do the same things again and again. These moments are times when that autopilot is weakened. So any product trying to change behavior should prioritize, prioritize those moments. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you, from a behavioral science perspective, I've, I've, got this hypothesis that you know that, that there could be a role a formal role for behavioral scientists within within retailers within manufacturers in terms of kind of product design do you, do you think it, it would be possible to build almost not the perfect product because that's too cliche but a very very strong performance product that had as many of the relevant kind of behavioral uh, biases baked in um yeah so so okay so I mean, there's two elements there there's, can behavioral science be applied to improve product design? Absolutely, yep. yes. And then the second bit of, would the perfect product have lots and lots of uh, biases involved? And that I'm not so sure about. So on the first point, you know, I think if you think about what behavioral science is, it is thousands upon thousands of uh, researchers running studies looking into what actually changes behavior mm -hmm. now i would struggle to think of a more relevant topic if you work in a retailer literally your whole job is trying to get people to change their behavior pick your shop yeah. over someone else's buy more of your stuff pay a price premium and literally there are thousands of studies out there already that someone else has funded uh, that have been done by very credible academic researchers that are done by a neutral group of people. They're literally sitting there on the, on the shelves of libraries. Right. All you have to do 
is as a very first step is take those findings and you know build on them and apply them to how you uh, uh, approach um, uh, your, your you know dealings with consumers right. so I, I think it's almost insane <clears throat> that more people aren't uh, applying this and the great thing is if you're a retailer I'm not saying you should take a study um, run on littering and say this is definitely going to work when I'm trying to sell beer. Mm -hmm. But you should take the academic experiment as a hypothesis with a reasonable degree yep. of proof around it, and then use your store as a way of of testing to see if it works in your particular category. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Take six stores and apply the bias. Take six stores and don't apply the bias, and then see what the difference in in performances now, they've got this giant laboratory why not why not use it so yeah absolutely if you're a retailer you should certainly be applying payroll science whether that means you have an individual who's responsible you know, that's one route you might want to bring in external experts um, you might want to create a culture where everyone in your company knows that payroll science. You know, each of those has their, their strengths and weaknesses so mm -hmm. but definitely 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 you should be applying it the second um, point you mentioned there about can you create a perfect product by layering on bias after bias after bias? Yeah. I'm a little bit more skeptical about that. Uh, and in my mind, if anyone's a Simpsons fan, I've got this image of Homer's perfect car where he kind of, you know, adds <laughs> on lots of different elements all to make it as, as good as possible. It's, it's kind of a, a bit of a flop. So that's, that's kind of my uh, buzzing alarm at the back of my head. Um, <laughs> but what I would say is I'm not sure you need to add on multiple biases. And you can look at product after product and see one really powerful application of a single bias mm -hmm. has been crucial in building that brand. So take something like uh, cough syrup. Um, mm -hmm. There are um, examples of brands around the world where they have um, drawn attention to the floor of that product. And this is true. So the brand I'm thinking about is, is Buckley's cough syrup. Uh, but it can equally be said for TCP or Listerine. Mm -hmm. Each of those products at different times in their product life cycle have drawn attention to their foul taste, um, you know, which is essentially a, a flaw. We mentioned earlier this study from Elliot Aronson. What he showed was if you admit a flaw as a brand, yep. you tend to become more appealing. Firstly, you become more believable. But secondly, if you choose the right flaw, it often has a mirror strength. So what those brands, Listerine, Buckley's and TCP have done is draw attention to how foul they taste. And what that insinuates in people's mind is that, well, if it tastes that bad, it must be bloody potent. It must be really effective. If something tastes yeah. that bad, it must be hugely effective in, in, in solving the problem. So that, I think, has been done by relentlessly pursuing a single bias and they've made very powerful um products mm -hmm. if they tried i think to layer on bias after bias there might be some you know attenuation of that effect. right okay. Um, okay and if people aren't aware of buckley's by the way it's a uh, number one selling cough syrup in, in canada it's this it was a family-owned brand and built for dominance of the market by uh, some wonderfully creative uh, around emphasizing its bad taste so they've got some you know, tagline, it tastes awful and it works. Um, things like uh, the largest bottle we sell is 250 milliliters. Any more would be uh, cruel. And they draw massive attention to their right. foul taste and then reap the reap the benefits. Okay. So trying to layer on too many biases would be a, a bit like, um, you yeah, know, trying to make too many positive claims about a product. Uh, if you've got a list of 11 or 12 positive claims, a consumer, they they just can't. Yeah, see the yeah, dreams, yeah exactly, exactly. I think I think you would have some um, the, the kind of backfire effects occurring. So there's, there's, I mean, there is a lovely set of studies by a psychologist called Zhang into what's called the gold dilution effect. Right. You know, recruits a great group of people, great large group of people, and gives them uh, an argument about why exercise is amazing. Mm -hmm. First group just see text on the fact that if you go out and jog, it's amazing for your heart health. Right. She, she, she essentially, in her own mind, categorizes this as a, as a strong um, reason to exercise. Next group, she gives them exactly the same text about jogging being great for heart health. 
but she adds on another bit, which is jogging is also great for your bone density. Right. And she argues, you know, this is a kind of mediocre reason to exercise. So what she's essentially given people is one great reason to exercise, other people a great reason to exercise, and a mediocre reason. Mm -hmm. What she finds is when she asks people later on, how good is jogging for your heart health? People who just heard the single argument believe it's better than those who heard the two arguments. Right, okay. Her point is arguments are averaging rather than additive. You know, if we you know, crudely said the, the heart health argument was a nine out of 10 reason to exercise and the uh, bone density was a seven out of 10 reason to exercise, you know, in that second scenario, you don't get a 16 um, points of um, persuasion. You get what, nine plus seven, eight uh, points. Yeah. You reduce the impact of, of, of those strong arguments by adding on right. mediocre ones. So, yeah, I, th I think you're right. If you try and be all things to all people, it's unbelievable and it undermines your, your core strength. Yeah. Um, I, I, we, we're in a, you know, a challenging time now around the cost of living crisis. There would be an easy argument to say that product innovation is likely to suffer over the next year as, as consumers focus exclusively on price. I mean, what, what are you seeing at the moment from a behavioural perspective that's happening in terms of the choices that consumers are, uh, are making? I'd say, for, well, from a behavioural science perspective, one of the big areas where there's lots of research done is around how to reduce price sensitivity. So right. we talked about, Nespresso have essentially done that, you know, they their benchmark is uh, Starbucks rather than roast and ground, so they can charge a massive massive premium. Now, that I think becomes more powerful. You know, you, 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 at least if your benchmark is a three pounds per cup, you've got quite a lot of opportunity to discount before you get down to, to unprofitable levels. Yeah, now, that's one study, but there are literally thousands of studies into reducing price sensitivity, which brands should be applying. If people are going more price sensitive, you've got to start applying this stuff. Uh, you know, if you're a restaurant, there's work from Sybil Yang in America, which shows if you take the dollar sign off the menu, so burger, $8, if you take the yep. dollar sign off, it just says burger, 8 yeah, people become 8% less price sensitive. Oh, interesting. The great right. thing with that insight is there's no cost to the brand. You've got to create menus. You've got to put the price on. You yep. might as well do it in a way that works with human nature rather than against it yeah um, there are all sorts of studies there's this idea called the rule of 100 for example um that gonzal is a uh from i think it's egad i don't know how to pronounce it egade school of business right. in Mexico. Uh, she shows that how you display a promotion should vary according to your original price so if you're a 200 pound product it's better to say 20 pounds off rather than 10 percent off but if you're a 10 pound product it's better say, to say um 20 percent off rather than two pounds off if right people okay. react almost naively to numbers they look at the headline figure rather than what that number represents right so okay. use the largest possible number and that can be an absolute amount can be a percentage but basically which one works best changes once you're past this threshold of 100 pounds right, so okay. lots and lots of different studies talk about how to reduce price sensitivity and i would argue with the cost of living crisis these become more important for, for brands to be applied yeah, yeah no doubt no, no doubt um and then I, I guess kind of um final you know final topic to discuss the um what, what do you see that the, the the innovation sector does does really well that maybe kind of consumers don't understand externally or is not shouted about um, externally, yeah, I, I mean, I think the key thing about consumers was to understand very little of it. I mean, any yeah. pr product in the supermarket um, represents you know, a, a tiny, tiny importance to every consumer. So, I think we overestimate how much people think of our brand. Um, yeah, for sure. And that does create problems because it, if we think people think lots about our brands, we assume their attention, that's a massive danger. And then we worry about causing offense or 
not being liked by people. Mm -hmm. Arguably, the much bigger danger is not being noticed at all and, and complete apathy. Yeah, so sure. I think I'd be very cautious about ever thinking that consumers put much thought at all into their toilet roll or uh, toothpaste or um, you know, liver spread or whatever you're, you're, you're buying. Yeah, yeah. But I think this, the cost of living crisis is a huge opportunity for private labour because this this is the, historically the time when uh, retailer own brands kind of can can flourish as people are making you know often quite quite blunt price choices between the the brand that is two pounds and the private label equivalent that might be a pound fifty uh, for example. So there's a there's a big opportunity yeah, yes. for, for own brand. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then final question, uh, Richard, what, what's the best product launch you've seen in the in the last last year or so? Oh, okay. Uh, great question. So um, maybe from a behavioural science perspective, and it's potentially more than a year ago, I think my idea of time is uh, is, is, uh, is, is faulty. I do love, uh, I've mentioned this before, but I love Wordle as a, as, a, as a product innovation. Right. And I think there are points about Wordle that can definitely be applied by products. So the reason I think Wordle is amazing is... What many people don't know is this game was launched in 2013. So a guy called Josh Wardle created it, launches this product, and essentially you've got six goes to guess a five-letter word. When he launches it, um, he lets people play as many games as they want every day, and it's a complete flop. 30 people are playing on a daily basis. Right. So he pulls it eventually. 2020... He goes through lockdown in New York and he becomes addicted to the New York Times crossword. Mm -hmm. And he begins to wonder why he loves this cryptic crossword so much. And he gets to the point where he thinks, well, actually, I think I love it because I'm always left wanting more. As soon as I finish the crossword, right. um, I have to wait a bit. Can't satisfy my desire. I've got to wait till tomorrow when the New York Times release the next one. So he thinks it's this uh, scarcity this lack of um, option to fulfill your needs, which, which makes it appealing. So he goes back to Wordle, recodes it, and now releases yeah. it, and you can only play one game per day. Right. And it's that sense. And he's, he's very specific about this is the reason what he wants to create. He wants to create this guest. He says, I want Wordle to be like a delicacy. I want it to be like a croissant that you try occasionally, not something that you sate yourself on again and again. And it's only when he introduces this false level of scarcity that sales, well, not sales, sorry, but the usage take off. You know, we've got a million right. people buying it a day now. Now, that principle of scarcity has been shown in controlled circumstances. Uh, there's a psychologist called Stephen Wirchel at the University of Virginia who ran a lovely study where uh, sometimes he serves people a glass jar full of 10 cookies and they rate those cookies as so so. Other times he serves them a glass, other he serves different groups of people a glass jar with just two cookies in. So right. even though the cookies are exactly the same, when they are in that limited supply, ratings of the cookie go up considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, 10, 11%. So it's not just this case study of Wordle, but there's experimental evidence that shows scarcity is a powerful determinant of the appeal of products. We want what we can't have. Right. Okay. Now that you can take to Product design. You know. Yeah. Have risk cream egg. Only buy it a few months a year. Uh, yeah. Phenomenally popular product. When they launched that, uh, um, it was had this you know, time scarcity. They, in the 80s, removed any time restrictions. You could buy it all year round. And Cadbury saw the sales drop. They put that scarcity back on. Mm -hmm. uh, McRib you know, launched early 80s, uh, complete flop. McDonald's decide to stop selling it. A few people complain. They say they absolutely love it. So they decide to bring it back, but just for a very limited time. You know, right. Limited uh, time you could buy it. When they introduce that scarcity element, that's when sales take off. Literally, the product was unpopular when it was a permanent item to the menu, when it just comes and goes, huge popularity. Right. That's These principles of scarcity, you can see again and again and again with products. You know, you look at loads of tech products. Gmail, invite-only, with Facebook, invite-only, Spotify, yep. invite-only. A huge number of products have, have embedded scarcity 
to generate that, that appeal, either at the beginning of their product lifestyle or on an ongoing basis. So yeah, I think yeah, Wordle yeah. for me is not just an amazing success, but it's got a behavioral insight of the heart that can be applied by far more, far more brands. Yeah, it feels very, as you say, very applicable to, to mass market products. I mean, that, that scarcity is used by fashion brands relatively extensively. You yeah, yeah. Collaborations now with, with people like Uniglo, Times, you know, glamorous yes. French designer, and it, it, they only do 500 pieces yeah. or a few items, and, and they're gone within half a day. And then you've got brands like Supreme, which they only yeah. do limited edition runs of, of everything, and there's queues outside their stores. Yes. Constantly. It's supreme so, almost yeah. like a sadistic uh, relationship with yeah. <laughs> customers. I yeah, can yeah. believe you know, they turn the website off for four months a year. Now you have to, you know, they'll do a drop every Thursday of new clothes, 11 a.m. at the store. You have to win a raffle to get a place to go to the store. And if yeah. you don't turn up, if you don't turn up, they won't let you buy anything for the rest of that season. But yet yeah, scarcity is the absolute heart of that brand. And their popularity is to the extent that they have they sell house bricks with the word supreme on for you know, hundreds of dollars you know they've and use this principle of scarcity to create um mental and financial value for right. completely anodyne products right how interesting um richard we are sadly out of time it has as always been fascinating uh, oh talking great. To you. Yeah, yeah i love it yeah thank you <laughs> Uh, thank you uh, very much for appearing on the uh, the Innovate uh, podcast, um, and we will no doubt catch up soon. Thank you, Richard. I hope so. Good to chat. See you soon. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.